Hi guys, this video is going to show you how I care for a Goliath tarantula and this will be suitable for the giant Therophosa species which include Therophosa apophysis, the pink foot Goliath as well as Therophosa blondi, the Goliath bird eater and the spider we have in this enclosure which is Therophosa sturmi, the burgundy Goliath Okay, well one of the most important things about caring for this species is maintaining a high humidity in the enclosure which I'm sure you already know as I just tell you that in all the care sheets that you can read and books as well as on the internet and as you can see I've actually connected a hydrometer which is currently reading 79% as you can see so yeah around 80% is a good, good amount of humidity so that's pretty much spot on and next I'll actually talk about the enclosure that I've set up for her because I actually decided to make one myself by drilling holes into a storage container but before we do that I just want to point out that when you do use a hydrometer you want to make sure you have it hovering above the substrate and not actually resting on it or buried into it because that will definitely affect the reading that you get so yeah, make sure it's actually in the air, measuring the humidity and not the moisture of the substrate. Okay then guys, now let's talk about this enclosure. Okay, well as you've probably noticed, there are lots of holes that have been drilled into the side of the container, as well as the top, to make it into a nice enclosure. And it's very important to do this because as well as a high humidity, this species also needs good ventilation to stop the air from becoming sterile in there. This enclosure actually measures 50 centimetres by 30 centimetres or 20 inches in length by 12 inches in width and the minimum size enclosure would be a 10 gallon aquarium which is around 10 inches in width by around the same length I think. If you do decide to use an aquarium you will need to include a lot more substrate to reduce the height of the enclosure because you don't want these species to fall they are very large and bulky and a fall from anything more than a few inches will probably be fatal to them so I, I prefer to use these plastic containers because not only are they cheaper they are smaller in height and you can easily stack them Okay, so I've removed the lid off the enclosure and you can get a better view of the spider now. This is an 8 inch subadult female Therophosa sturmi, the Burgundy Goliath. Now she has only been in here for a few days and as you can see she's already laid down silk around most of the enclosure. And this is the area that she seems to hang out in. So I'm pretty sure she's settled in now. And you can see she has decided not to use the hide I provided. Now it is a bit hard to see at the moment because she's covered the entrance with silk but the hide does actually go from where you can see the entrance there to all the way to the end of the enclosure and it's a large half a flower pot buried into the substrate. It's always a good idea to provide a hide though for these species because if you keep them in a light area they will prefer to hide away However, I like to keep my room quite dark, which means that they don't feel the need to hide, and I get to see them a lot more often. <laughs> so yeah, that's what works for me, but other keepers will keep them differently. I've, be, I've had this girl for two and a half years now, and she has molted three times, and grown from a juvenile into a huge subadult female. Which brings me on to the next point, which is feeding. The huge Therophosa species do need a lot more food than your average tarantula, because not only are they a lot larger, they tend to grow faster and have a high metabolism. So yeah, um, you want to feed either lots of small prey items or a few larger ones. I would say probably one or two cockroaches every couple of weeks or at least five or six crickets depending on what you decide to use 
but a good judge of how much food your spider is getting is the size of the abdomen. These spiders might overeat and become slightly obese. As you can see she has got quite a large abdomen so she won't be getting any more cockroaches until she next molts. Just be crickets from now on. So yeah, uh, that's the feeding covered. The only other thing really is the water dish. Very important with these species because a good sized water dish will help with the humidity and these spiders will drink if they become dehydrated so it's always a good idea to keep one in there just in case. It is worth pointing out that this species is only recommended for experienced hobbyists because it is hard to get the humidity right in the enclosure but yeah once you've had some experience with some species that do need a higher humidity then it's a very good species to get they are nowhere near as aggressive as people think they are slightly defensive though so you do need to be careful when handling them but the major thing is those urticating hairs on the abdomen some of the worst that I've ever dealt with the only species worse than the blondie and the stermy is the apophysis so if you react badly to hairs I would definitely not recommend getting the apophysis okay so before you decide that you're going to go and buy one of these giants thought we may as well talk about the pros and cons of owning this species or any other glide species and we'll start off with the pros it is one of the largest spiders in the world and probably the heaviest so it's a very awesome addition to her collection and she is the star of my collection as being the largest spider as well as the heaviest another reason to get one is that you get to see the meat quite a lot because they are very hungry species so I thought we may as well feed her a cricket now to demonstrate this <laughs> Okay, here he goes. There you go. Nice take down there. <laughs> See those massive fangs just destroying that cricket. But I'm afraid there are probably more reasons not to get one, and that is they do need a lot of space. Have you got space for a large enough enclosure to house one? Uh, they also are quite expensive. Adult females go between 60 to 100 pounds in the UK. And they aren't easy to look after. They do need a high humidity, as we've mentioned. And also, a lot of specimens seem to have molting problems. Whether that's because people keep them in the wrong conditions, I don't know. Or it could be something to do with the diet in captivity. Nobody's really sure. If you can remember Rob C. Zilla, she was a Theraphosostermy in a massive aquarium. And he did say he kept her in the right humidity. Which we only have his word for, but I'm sure he did. And she had a molting problem and died from it. So that's another downside to owning these species. And another very good reason not to get one is that there are other species that get almost as big and are a lot easier to care for for example the salmon pink bird eater Lassidora parahibana very easy to care for and get almost as big so yeah that's what you need to consider before you buy one I hope you've enjoyed watching and I shall see you again soon okay so I've just realised that there's a couple of things I forgot to mention. The first one is the temperature. Uh, we're now looking at my thermometer-hydrometer combo. That's just um, telling me the room temperature and the humidity in the room. So as you can see it's 21 degrees now, or 21.5, and 61% humidity. I like to keep my Theraphosa species slightly cooler than is recommended in most of the books. I say around 21 to 23 during the day and around 19 to 20 at night and the other thing I forgot to mention was the substrate in the enclosure uh, you want to use a good thick layer at least 5 or 6 inches and this will retain the humidity longer 
and releasing it slowly into the enclosure. And also the type of substrate, which I've used cocoa fibre, which comes in expandable blocks, you just add water to. And yeah, I think that really is it now guys. <laughs> Thanks for watching, and I shall see you again soon.